we're happy that you're here. As I said, recording will be posted uh, this week for the previous one and the and the current one. Um, sorry for the side um, sound. Uh, we're so happy to have the second uh, webinar with Michelle Ciccone, uh, PhD uh, student at uh, UMass Amherst, and previously uh, integra technology integration um, a coordinator specialist in um, uh, in school. So she has like the class understanding and the struggle with the teachers, but also the academic background here. So Michelle, take it away. Thank you. Um, and you can hear me okay? I'm not going in and out. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to share this screen. Okay. Okay, and you can see that okay, I'm going to assume. Great. Um, hi, thank you so much for joining um me today in this webinar thanks for joining the media education lab i'm usually teaching at this time so i'm not able to join the monday at noon webinars um, but today in massachusetts is patriots day it's a very um local uh holiday and so i have school off and so i can be here today and i'm excited for that um yeah, just to give a little bit of background, Yanti already shared. Um, I am Michelle Ciccone. Um, I am a second year PhD student in communication in the, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, I was a digital literacy teacher and technology integration specialist in both the middle school and the high school here in Massachusetts. Um, and I like to say that I've worked in ed tech since 2011, first um, within nonprofits um, and then within K-12 schools. And I'm kind of saying I like to say because it's not, um, you know, that's um, me casting my history in a certain way when I joined my first nonprofit in 2011. The nonprofit did um, summer learning programs like we we coordinated summer learning programs but very quickly um, into my job that I had there my boss said to me hey Michelle I've heard about this thing called blended learning can you do some research and tell us what it is we should do it and I had never heard this phrase before maybe some of you um uh, I got excited about blended learning like I did. Um, and yeah, so I, I started to do research on it and I really was very excited about it. And I mean, basically blended learn, I don't even know if we still use this term anymore, blended learning. Um, but, you know, back then in the heady days of early 2010s, blended learning was the idea that um, like classroom learning could happen in many different modes. It could be face-to-face, -face, um, it could be online, it could be a mixture of the two. Um, and blended learning was kind of a, um, uh, a way to communicate some of our hopes at the time for what digital learning could be. It could be a way to increase the teacher student ratio because some of the times stu some students would be on a computer working on adaptive software um, so that meant that the teacher could be working with a smaller group of students and give those students uh, more um, more personalized more individualized attention um, so even at the at the beginning of this there was a sense of um, you know this Blended learning was important because um, students needed to, to learn how to use technology to to prepare themselves for the future where technology would be in their workplace and in college. Um, but it also was a strategy for a certain kind of um, a, a certain kind of vision for what um, education could be. Um, and I'll just say as the last piece of history of myself. Um, so like I really got into blended learning and then kind of started questioning the those assumptions that were baked in to to the model like that, um, you know, that it could lead to more personalized learning. And I discovered media literacy in the 2016 Summer Institute in Digital Literacy. Um, and maybe like some of you who um, your history with media literacy, for me, it really was just like this light bulb moment, like, oh, here's a group of people who are asking the same questions that I am about um, digital technologies and learning. 
So I just wanted to like share some of that history because I kind of want to I want to be very transparent about what I'm bringing into this conversation today. Um, so first of all, as like I've I'm sharing, I fell for techno hype before and I'm skeptical now. Maybe some of you can relate to that, but I really, I really drank the Kool Aid in the early 2010s. Um, and it really, um, you know, it was a journey for me to come to the understanding that maybe things weren't as rosy as, um, as those, uh, you know, those early conversations about blended learning were. Um, so I am skeptical now and I want to be transparent. Like I, I've named this webinar you know the hype around ai like it's because i'm skeptical so i'm not going to pretend like i'm not another thing i want to be transparent about i have never used chat gpt and i don't say that like it's a badge of honor but i'm realizing that i am just not really an early adopter of technologies which made being a technology integration specialist kind of like it, it was an interesting experience to be a non early adopter as a tech integration specialist, but I say that because um, you know this is not a webinar where i'm going to be able to share like best practices or ways of thinking of using it, and I think the other webinars in this series are going to be much better at that than I ever could be because I am not coming with that um, with that experience. I am also grappling with how to address ChatGPT in my classroom. Um, I'm not in K-12 anymore, but as a grad student, I am teaching undergrads at UMass. And this semester, I'm teaching a junior year writing class. And I'm also TAing for a computer science class called Introduction to Public Interest Technology. And this has given me two wildly different experiences in the classroom at this historical moment of you know, winter, spring, 2023. In my junior year writing class that I'm teaching, I, and my syllabus, you can't use ChatGPT, which just like, that's not what we're doing here. I don't have anything, you know, if, if on your own time, that's fine. But th those were, that's what I set in my own class. The class that I'm TAing for, I want to say that my professor is encouraging students to use it, but she's she's welcoming students to use ChatGPT for very particular writing assignments. And so I feel like it's been a very interesting experience for me to see like how those two decisions have sort of influenced what happens in the classroom or not. I feel like the semester's still ongoing. I have to reflect a lot more on this, but um, so if you're sitting here and you're like, I don't know what to do about ChatGPT in my classroom, I'm with you. We're all in that together. Um, and then finally, the last thing I kind of want to be transparent about is I'm really I am very curious about the text that ChatGPT spits out or and or like the the whatever is generated by this like class of technologies. And I'm also interested in how people use it. But I'm even more curious about the whole discourse around ChatGPT. So that's another thing, like at the outset. Um, uh, yeah, this webinar, I want to focus on like, yeah, what's like the conversation about this tool and this like class of technologies, um, not necessarily, um, yeah, like what gets spit out. And again, I think the other um, the other webinars in the series are going to be better at that than I am here. Um, I also want to say that my slides are really boring and sorry about that, but hopefully it's um, not distracting. So on this topic of the discourse, the conversation around these technologies, I've just been very fascinated watching the conversation play out online within my institution, um, with my classmates and colleagues. Um, and ever since, you know, ChatGPT was announced uh, or was released at the end of November 2022, um, I just had this, I this real sense of inevitability that has crept into the conversations immediately. And I was, I'm really curious about that. Like why, like why was, why this technology got released and then, and then the feeling was, okay, we live in the world now with chat GPT and we just got to figure that out. We just got to learn to live with that. Um, so that's something that I'm, I've honestly become obsessed about. I'm doing a couple of projects um, in a couple of my classes, final projects on this, um, like this language of inevitability, the discourse of inevitability. Um, and I think this like idea of hype is really at the center of, um, of this, this feeling that um, grew very quickly. Um, and so again, 
the fact that I am using the word hype means I'm not neutral on this and just being really clear about that. I do think that um, I, I would characterize um, a lot of what's being, the, the way that the conversation is playing out as a form of hype. And here's dictionary.com's um, definition of hype. Um, it's exaggerated, it's for publicity and promotion, um, deceptive in some way. And I think that hype plays out in several different ways. So hype can be really positive. Hype, um, hype can look like, you know, YouTube videos or explainers. This one, 21 insanely useful ways to use chat GPT. It can also look like articles, many, many articles about how teachers are using chat GPT in the classroom, a hundred prompts that might be good for, that might be useful to you. Um, and as someone who's worked in ed tech for a while and gone to ed tech conferences, those sessions that are like 50 apps in 50 minutes, like it kind of feels like that sort of, it's like the five or hose of like, here's all the great ways you can be productive with this tool. So hype can certainly be positive, but hype can also be negative. Like hype can be drummed up through like fear and, and negative publicity. Um, here's two really famous, well, famous, I don't know if I could use the word famous. Here was two high profile examples of of negative hype. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the the AI pause letter. Um, so that's the screenshots over here on the left. Um, so this was a letter that was put out, um, I think at the end of March. Oh yeah, March 22nd. Um, and some really high profile people like Elon Musk signed this AI pause letter. And it's, um, you, can, you could go to this website and you could sign it too. You can read through the text and you can see um, here um, that you know, this is a group of people who feel that we need to pause the development of, a, of these sort of generative AIs because they're so dangerous, because we have no control over them. They're human competitive intelligence that, that pose profound risk to society and humanity. And this letter has gotten some critique that, okay, you're kind of like overblowing this. Um, overblowing the fears here. Um, and then on the right here is a screenshot from um, an article that also got a lot of critique. Um, Kevin Roos, of, he's a New York Times tech columnist. Um, and he, you know, at first he put out this column that he, he was very, um, you know, he was really like excited about Bing's use of um, a, a generative AI in its search tool. Um, but then he started prompting it in a certain way, and he start he elicited some what he called hallucinations um, from the chap from from Bing, and he got he got unsettled and nervous. And this article got a lot of critique. It's like, okay, you're the you're swinging the pendulum and you're stoking fear in a way that is its own kind of hype. Like this fear can become its own kind of hype. Hype can also look like predictions. Um, on the left here at the end of March, um, Goldman Sachs put out um, this report that says, you know, 300 million jobs are going to be impacted by generative AI um, and, or, or a third of all jobs. Um, and that got people kind of scared and, you know, there's and this happens i mean this has happened for decades with um automated automation technologies fears of um job loss and um just like the the impact on the on the labor um labor force also you know if, if in december um uh, open ai said that they're going to make a billion dollars in revenue in 2024 i don't know if that's true it might be true that they're going to make a billion dollars in revenue it costs a lot of money for open ai to run um their gpt technologies um so they need a lot of money to keep going but they're saying th through an anonymous source um, that they're projecting a billion dollars and i think we've seen this a lot in the tech industry overinflated um, valuations, which can make it seem like these companies are extremely, um, extremely successful and profitable. But these predictions can be their own kind of hype as well. 
Um, hype can get attached to a particular product or company. And I'm trying to be kind of careful. Like whenever I say chat GPT, I want to call it a pro I want to make sure I'm calling it a product because it is a product. It's a product of one company. Um, and so Timnit Gabru, who you might've heard of, she's a co-author of the stochastic parrots, um, article that I know, um, at the media club meeting, um, at the beginning of March, I guess, it, or no, beginning of this month, beginning of April, which I missed because I was teaching, but I watched the recording and I know that in that webinar, um, you all talked about the stochastic parrots article. So Tim Nick Abreu is a very, um, a very well-known critic of, um, not only these, these like large language model technologies, but also like the industry hype around them. Um, and so she's, she's, um, she's been really inf um, instructive in pointing out how, um, you know, and through that stoch stochastic parrots article, how um, the the power of the largest companies get reinforced through the hype of this one product, ChatGPT. Um, OpenAI is reliant on Microsoft servers to run to run this line of products, um, and you know, so so very quickly there's a bunch of um, generative AI tools that are built on top of OpenAI's um, technologies, and um, and so Tim Nickabrew is instructive in helping us see how these um, like these big players are getting sort of um, you know embedded in the market in a way that is you know maybe becoming infrastructural but um just something to keep in mind that hype can get attached and and um uh through force of will if not like actual um uh use useful technology can can um over inflate the prominence of a company um hype can also be reinforced via product design um something that uh Again, I've never used ChatGPT, but I've sat next to classmates who use it. Uh, a lot of my classmates do, um, and so my classmates will sometimes turn to ChatGPT and like ask it questions to help to to like further our conversation. And I have noticed like how it works. Um, you type something in, you get little dot 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 um, like a thought bubble, and then it types out like one word by one word, word by word, um, and that itself is a is a choice it's a, it's a design choice of um op that open ai put into this chat gpt um this chat bot um and this is a very interesting um uh interview so okay a couple of weeks ago senator chris murphy he tweeted something out like chat gpt taught itself um advanced chemistry i'm not really sure what advanced chemistry exactly refers to but that's what he said and it got a lot of replies like you're not helping the situation you're stoking fears this is very imprecise um and so this is an interesting interview um in venture beat with um a former uh, white house ai policy advisor and he points to that design choice of the dot 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 and the uh, chat GPT spitting out one word at a time. And he's, he says in this interview that that design choice is, is reinforcing the idea that users are interacting with a sentient bot, that someone is thinking on the other end. And he says that, you know, these other generative AI tools don't do that. Google Bard doesn't do that. Um, and so like that type of um, product design can can reinforce a sense of hype as well. Um, and then finally, I would say hype gets reproduced through our vocabulary, um, even something like smart technology. So technologies that are connected to the Internet in some way, um, you know, like 10 years ago or, or maybe less than that, um, got labeled as smart technologies and that word smart. Um, is conjuring a certain expectation in us for what those technologies can do and will do. Even the word intelligence and artificial intelligence is really stoking expectations or thoughts about what these technologies can do. Um, in that Kevin Roos article I screenshotted, he wrote, he used the word hallucination, that AI can hallucinate. Um, and there's been some a lot of pushback on that. So like AI researchers will say that they'll say 
that this AI hallucinated something and, and churned out something that's not true or it's not based in fact or, it, and, you know, I think we can we hear a lot that ChatGPT makes up references and sometimes people will call that a hallucination. Um, and, you know, again, that's like that's um, uh, in, uh, stoking this idea that there's a mind on the other side. Another thing that AI researchers will say um, is this model understands um, and uh, there's pushback on that like how can a model understand a model like spit something out uh, can you call that understanding um, a recent episode of tech won't save us which is a really great podcast that interviewed emily bender who was another co-author on the stochastic parrots um, article. Um, they mentioned in that podcast episode that even uh, maybe you remember hearing the sharing economy like eight years ago when like Uber came out and um, Airbnb. Well, I guess that's more than eight years ago. Whenever all those whenever those apps came out. And, you know, at the time it was called the sharing economy, this idea that, you know, we are sharing our goods with each other. Um, but in recent years, the sharing economy has kind of receded and we now call it the gig economy. And even that flip in the label um, recenters what's happening. The sharing economy is, oh, we're like, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're sharing, uh, we're sharing with each other versus, you know, the gig economy has very real impact on the, um, you know, the Uber drivers and, you know, um, housing policy in cities through Airbnb and all that. So even flipping labels can, um, can reproduce hype in certain ways. And then even, even the word automation, um, how we use the word automation to describe these technologies and which sort of, um, covers over the humans that are in uh, in computer science. You say that it's the there's humans in the loop, um, and you know um, um, there's always there's always humans that are either cleaning the data sets or helping to train the models or clean or or fixing errors that come out. ChatGPT worked with um, workers in I think it was Kenya for. for paying very little amount of money to um, to help clean up what was coming out of ChatGPT to sort of get rid of the, um, you know, offensive, racist, bigoted stuff that was coming out of ChatGPT. And so even using the word automated is feeding this hype that these these are automated technologies and erasing the, the real human, the humans that are working um, that are that are in the loop throughout the process. Um, so you know that's so first and foremost hype happens in a lot of different ways um and but media literacy gives us the tools to see through this hype um so we are we're not powerless to this hype and we we already have we already have the tools um here there's you know several versions of sets of key questions of media literacy i'm using the media education labs um the smartphone um the set of questions that are on the back of the smartphone handout um and so you know we in media literacy we have these questions in our back pocket because it helps us to recenter and to when we encounter media content to ask you know critical questions to understand what we're encountering um like who is the author and what's the purpose what techniques are used to attract and hold your attention what lifestyles values and points of view are represented how might different people interpret the message and what is omitted from the message so we already have these questions in our back pocket to help us slow down and to act when we encounter some coverage some media coverage of these of these um generative ai tools um, or chat gpt in particular we already have these questions um to to help to to investigate inquire about um, what we're encountering um and so something that i'm personally really interested in is you know being being having worked in having worked in k-12 schools now working in higher ed now being a grad student and my research area is schools and the relationship between schools and the tech industry and the use of ed tech within schools so this is something that as i'm seeing the chat gpt conversation play out um i'm wondering how are schools getting roped in to this techno hype um and so i really quickly just want to offer one way that I can see that schools are getting roped in here. 
um, and using and I don't have time to go through all of the media literacy, the key questions, but just I'll use a couple. Um, oh, and I, I want to say like schools getting roped in to techno hype this there is nothing new about this. Um, schools for decades have been seen as part of well as the researcher Lena Rom, who does research on um, uh, the use of, of AI and automation in the last 75 years and how schools have been uh, you know implicated in the remaking of society and, and the work and work um, how schools have been roped in um, and she finds in her research that schools have education schools um, have often been seen as the most appropriate and effective form for adjusting the citizen to the effects of computerization. So there is nothing new about schools getting roped into techno hype and having to respond to um, technological, um, you know, innovations or like new products. Um, so I, I kind of want to, I want to look at this document um, really quickly, um, or at least excerpts of it. Um, maybe some of you have seen this. OpenAI put out this web page. The URL is here at the bottom. Um, and I think it was in response to a lot of conversation, concern about, okay, you launched ChatGPT. Now, what do we do as in education? What are we? What do we do? So OpenAI, I think it was like in January, they put out this web page, Educator Considerations for ChatGPT, and you can go through and read it if you haven't yet. Um, there's not a lot of helpful information. Like I think probably this community would have a lot more um, helpful, interesting things to um, to to offer. Um, but I do think it's it's interesting to look at this document coming from OpenAI and and trying to understand like okay, what do they see as educator considerations for ChatGPT? Um, and so first, I want to pull on the fifth key question of media literacy. What is omitted from this message? Um, and again, I am just taking I'm taking snapshots. Like I'm um, I am not doing the document justice. Be transparent about that. But um, and I, I will say I'm also like really fascinated by documents like this. That this is not exactly an FAQ, a frequently asked question document, but it kind of is. Um, and I'm really I'm just like always really in intrigued by okay, what's included in an FAQ? But what there's always something left out. What's left out? So um, I'm kind of zeroing in on this one section, um, job opportunities and outlooks. Um, and this document from OpenAI says, um, if not managed well, uh, so, so, you know, it's saying um, AI is going to affect work and we're not exactly sure how, um, but if not managed well, these changes could present new challenges for students as they face an uncertain future. Educators will need to help students grapple with these questions. We consider the economic impacts of language models specifically and AI generally to be highly uncertain. Okay, that feels pretty neutral, sure. Well, what's omitted, OpenAI is actively engaged in remapping the future of work. So it's it's super interesting to me that they're framing it in this document as, hey, nobody knows. When OpenAI is, you know, entering into um, business relationships with, for example, Bain and Company, which is a, um, which is a management management consultancy company, so they work with, you know, really big companies and help companies think about how to um, be a, you know, the best company they can and, you know, of the future and responding to market forces and, you know, they help they help companies adjust to the realities of um, of the market. Um, and so, you know, OpenAI is has. In in a partnership with Bain and Company. Um, also, OpenAI um, has has long been in relationship with Microsoft. Um, as I said, OpenAI relies on Microsoft servers to run their products. Um, and you know, Microsoft is embedding OpenAI products into their search engine, into their, their into their um, office suite. Um, and so, you know, Microsoft products are used in businesses across the world. Um, and so it's it's just very curious to me that, um, you know, that's left out. That's left out of the conversation. I'm not surprised, of course, but um, something I think that the key questions of media literacy can help us to um, can help us to probe a, a, within a document like this. Um, and then just one more question I want to pose to this um, this OpenAI document. Um, the, the third 
key question of media literacy, what lifestyles, values, and points of views are represented. Um, and this document from OpenAI, I think, um, does a pretty good job of like walk, talking the talk. Um, so for example, um, this is early on in the document, they say, you know, under this subheading examples of education related risks and opportunities. While we are excited about many applications of generative AI within educational context, we think it's important that, like any technology, it be introduced into the classroom under the supervision of educators. And, you know, typically I can't, I'd, I agree with that and I argue for that. I think that it is important for, you know, me as a teacher to help my students to understand um, the use of this technology um, and how they can or, you know, the limitations of it. But it's, it's, it becomes a little different when the company itself Itself that produces the product is encouraging me and saying that it is my job to um, to introduce my students to this technology in the classroom. Um, and then, you know, under the heading equity and access, OpenAI says the increasing ubiquity of technologies like ChatGPT makes it important for uh, for students to have equal levels of access to these tools and to learn how to use them effectively. Again, talking the talk, yes access is so important, especially when it comes to digital technologies, but it becomes a little bit different when the company producing this this product is telling me that my students need equal access to their product. Um, and so, you know, once again, this key question of media literacy can help us to um, to examine what um, uh, a document like this. Um, and you know, my, the final the final idea I want to introduce here um, is how can media literacy help us examine the technologies themselves? Um, so these five key questions of media literacy and and other um, uh, sorts of uh, similar sets of questions is very much focused on the te on text and content, and it helps us to ask questions of text that we encounter and text, you know, very broadly understood, um, you know, written text, visual text, video, um, uh, audio, visual, all sorts of text. Um, but examining a technology itself, um, you know, I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about um, how to how to kind of finagle those questions to apply um, more directly to um, to a technology. Um, and here's some initial ideas of how to do that. And I'm, this is something that um, I want to pose to this group, like how we how we could use these questions to, to, um, to probe a technology like ChatGPT, not not the content that it spits out or not the marketing materials about it or coverage of the technology of, of the of the product but the technologies themselves um so here's some ideas of how to do that um but i also want to introduce to the group um this set of questions that um uh, a group called civics of technology um, who i contribute to um, sometimes um, they've put together these five techno skeptical questions um, and this is th these questions are um, a, are built on a lecture that neil postman gave i think in the 70s i for, i should have looked up what year that lecture was um, but neil postman you know a grandfather of media literacy in many ways um, um, so here's so civics of technology have put together these five questions to that are geared more towards examining the tech itself. And so the five questions are what does society give up for the benefits of the technology, who is harmed and who benefits from the technology, what does the technology need. What are the unintended or unexpected changes caused by the technology? And why is it difficult to imagine our world without the technology? Um, and I, I, you know, a question I want to pose to the group is how to put these five questions in conversation with the five key questions of media literacy. They are certainly, um, you know, not um, uh, mutually exclusive. I think they, they build off of each other um, in a really productive way. Um, and I was going to answer, well, I'm going to skip this and because I want to move into small groups. So here um, are some questions that I would love to um, talk with you all about. Um, and I can copy these into the chat. Um, but here are five, five questions that I'm curious um, to discuss. So what kind of hype have you seen? So I've presented to you some hype that I've seen that's made me really curious. What have you seen in the media? 
Um, and then I'm curious your experience. How has the hype entered your institution? What pressures has this hype exerted on or within your institution already? So like, what are you experiencing? How are you being called to respond and deal with the hype? Um, what options do we have in responding to this hype? We as educators or whoever we are, whatever our positionality is here in, um, in this Zoom room right now, what options do we have in responding to this hype? Um, and then the last two questions are on this topic of thinking about, um, you know, these key questions that can help us to when we're encountering new technologies or um, coverage of new technologies, how do we make sense of it? So how might the civics of technologies, techno skeptical questions help us see the impact of technologies in our institutions? Um, and then, you know, what additional or retooled media literacy questions would help us to make sense of the techno hype? So I'm going to um, stop sharing. I'm going to share these slides in the chat so you can have access to them. And then I'll put the questions themselves in the chat. Let's see, I hope this works. Okay. Oh, they're all jumbled. Okay, I'm just gonna put a jumbled mess of questions. Um, and yeah, I don't know, Davina, how long, how long do you think we should do this for? Um, did you want to do breakout, Michelle? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, well, I think, is that, is that okay? Is that yeah, sure. make sense? Okay. So, um, between maybe two of us, or if someone wants to volunteer to share breakout, one more person maybe. I'm going to use my webinar series manager credentials and ask um, Professor Renee Hobbs to <laughs> one of the breakouts for us. So there'll be three people. So there'll be like 10 to 11 participants per room. Yeah. <clears throat> so Sounds I'm just going to open the room for 10 minutes. Lots of discussion, <laughs> lots of discussion time, like half an hour. <laughs> I'm sorry. We need a whole session on breakouts alone. It's in, in general, just in general in the media lab, you know, it's the conversations, you don't have these conversations with people, you know, in your neighborhood or even my friends, they wouldn't know what I'm talking about. So this is so stimulating. Too bad we can't be in person. We just drone ourselves to a central location and then go, go home. Oh. Well, you know, on that note, I mean, do well, I don't know, Davina, if, should I, did I, or do you want, I, okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna ask, who wants, to, who wants to share something that you discussed in, in your breakout that you want to, you want to raise up here? We really just got started, but we started talking about the questions of what do we need to know about algorithms in order to use them in the right places and not use them in the wrong places. And we started talking about what it means for the workforce, which is something I hope a future session will address. So it, we, we, we just were getting going. <laughs> We talked about ethics and we started to talk about ethics and morality and the need to to have a conversation and, and especially with students about what is this all about? You know, what, you know, philosophically speaking, what rights and wrongs, and I don't want to be so black and white, but that's a, a good summation. Another thing that came up in our group was, um, you know, this theme of inevitability that Michelle was bringing up and how often that 
get unquestioned. That becomes like the leading um, idea for why we have to use this and we have to adopt it in what I think is often an uncritical way. Um, and it's, oh, sorry, I had another thought that I'm now losing. I guess like one thing that I keep scratching my head about is that there doesn't seem to be very much discussion of what gets lost then when you say, okay, well, we're just going to use AI for writing, for example. Like I haven't heard people very often bringing up how writing is a process for thinking, clarifying, um, conversation, inquiry, and that these things like if you just say, because, you know, like at our university, they had a um, someone from OpenAI actually come in and give us what felt to me a little bit like a sales pitch. And we had a lot of um, professors who were like those people who were pushing back against like this not doing what they wanted to do with writing assignments being told um, that, you know, you kind of it's here to stay. So you've got to like embrace this. So that kind of like it almost feels like a unwillingness to have a conversation about what might get lost or not even realizing that that's a conversation to have. And I guess another thought I'm having is just like ideally we encourage students to unpack assumptions that you're making in any given situation. I feel like we as educators need to be doing this unpacking of assumptions about like what are the assumptions we're making in relation to these kinds of tools. I, I want to say something really quick in response to that. Thank you for sharing, um, Andrea. I, something that I, I keep thinking about is how schools were preparing students for the future. In what ways are we creating the future that we're saying we're preparing them for? And like, you know, and I don't know, like, I, I think I, I do think we have to reflect on that as educators, like we're not preparing them for this inevitable, our students for inevitable future. Like we are making that future inevitable by preparing them for that future. And I don't know, it makes me uncomfortable to think of it that way, but it's just something I've been thinking about lately. I wonder also who, who will have the opportunity. We are so um, in niches in this society and people that are in the um, lower um, economic bracket, but what's gonna be for them? You know, because their opportunity to even further to learn certain information is probably limited, especially if we continue with or on track with college debt and putting people's backs against the wall. So whose future of work, you know, um, and I'm, it's a, it's rhetorical. Are we are we speaking about, you know? So like the sh sharing society, good luck in this country. We are what I call phony individuals and the Sesame Street mentality is about where we, we shake out. So um, hard to know. Michelle, I'm just curious, did you come across in any of your research, who are the people and what kind of people in invented the GP chat, I mean, you know, their personalities more than than anything else, you know? That's a great question. I mean, there's a lot of money going into this technology. <laughs> Elon Musk was an early, an early contributor. Peter Thiel, who you might know, he's a very, I would label dangerous right wing um, mm -hmm. person in Silicon Valley. He's a big contributor. So I, I do. Th um, yeah, Sam Altman um, is like is the founder and um, I think CEO. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that, you know, who like the a critical question of media literacy is like, who's the author? I think that question reframing that for a technology is, yeah, who's behind this? Like what where's the money coming from? Um, and uh, um, and I, I think that that's worth asking for technologies. And me, I guess there's many, many nice people in Silicon <laughs> Valley. I don't mean to paint with a broad brush. Um, Peter Thiel, I do, I do yeah. not think is one of them, but that's maybe my personal bias. And of course we can look at all the algorithms now from Facebook. I just did a paper on Facebook's newsfeed. So this is the beginning. This shows you, you know, what the branding, what people are at, the money, it's the money, you know, 
I mean, Clinton had the economy stupid, it, adding it's the money stupid also to the to that phrase. So it's it's scary. <laughs> Um, Michelle, I would love it if you could just quickly wrap up in the next two minutes that I could close in the last three minutes. Absolutely. Um, yeah, well, thank you all so much. I, I agree this was not enough time, but um, thanks for um, engaging with some of these ideas along with me. Um, and, um, you know, this is a conversation I'd love to keep having about um, how media literacy can help us to understand technologies um, themselves even more and how we can um, help each other to identify um, hype versus, you know, well, identify the hype and help each other to, to deal with that, um, to deal with that hype and, and maybe push back when we need to. Um, but thank you so much, Davina and company. Thank you so much, Michelle. I really like the framing of looking at all of these new technologies in the context of hype and what's real and what's not, and what's to stay and what's to go. Um, if you're interested more about AI in the classroom, we have a fabulous webinar series. We just had Frank speak earlier this month. And next time on the 4th of May, we have our very own Pamela Morris. I saw her here. Here she is. Hi, Pam. Uh, she's going to be leading a webinar on AI in the classroom. And then after that, we have one more series. But what we did last month, oh no, sorry, this month, on the first Monday in, on April, in April, was we had a media club on uh, a skeptical take on AI revolution. And uh, Michelle mentioned that recording. So what I've done in the chat is I've added a link to the AI in the classroom webinar series. You can click on that. And look at all the webinar sheets that we've had so far. This is the second one. We've got three more lined up and then more we're planning for till the end of July. And then we have a link of the recording of the April Media Club, which was on Ezra Klein's podcast uh, on a skeptical take on AI revolution. And the hosts really put together a bunch of lovely resources. Uh, and, you know, Michelle also tipped her hat to them about the stochastic parrots and and then we also put together this little Google Doc uh, for that media club, uh, which is here called April Media Club Resources in chat. Um, the hosts have also put in their slides. Michelle also added slides to today's webinar in the Google chat. Uh, I'm sorry, in the Zoom chat. And finally, I'm putting the link for May's media club. So what we're doing is, we knew that this was a topic that people wanted to discuss more about. And after laying the groundwork in April's Media Club, May's Media Club is going to workshop the ideas that we discussed in April. So if you didn't get a chance to join, I know a lot of people join uh, uh, who are here as well today. But if you didn't get a chance to join the April Media Club, the recordings there, resources are there. Uh, the AI webinar series has been uh, happening. This is the second one. It's going to happen till the end of July. Um, you can sign up for those. And I hope to see a lot of you again for the May Media Club, which is the first of May, the first Monday. That's it. We are on time. Thank you so much for joining us today. See you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Have a nice day.